Lola, what's wrong with her knee? Because you notice her limping. And before she does, she tells you an elaborate story that when she was a kid, she was the fastest runner in her class. And how she carries the bilao, the wooden tray, with just the perfect sway in her hip. Now in America, she doesn't get to do a lot of gardening like she used to in her province. And then you go and ask Lola again. Okay, Lola, but but what's wrong with your knee? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I fell in the kitchen. In today's episode, we'll talk about patterns of communication and how this is different from the American way of communication. Stay right there. Are Filipinos truly bilingual? We use the same language at home, but speak and love languages foreign to each other. Together but separated. Kamusta? I'm Rowan, licensed psychotherapist mom, immigrant twice, first generation Pinay raising my mixed Filipino American children in America. I found that after visiting 500 Filipino homes, I continued to be a student of the culture. In this podcast, we would be seatmates in this beautiful cultural classroom. And by the way, did I tell you I need my kaping barako straight from Batangas before each class? If you're interested in learning the deep intricacies of the Filipino culture, especially as it merged with American culture, talks about trauma-informed care, and deepening your Filipino relationships across generations, which includes my fave topic, Pinoy Love Languages, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. Again, this is Rowan. So we're going to be talking about the difference, the pattern of communication between American versus Filipino. So in the beginning, we talked about the Lola, the case of Lola. So that's the first one. The first difference is linear versus circular type of communication. They also call this polychronic which is uh, the circular versus monochronic. We'll stick to the first linear and circular. It's, it's, more, it's more colloquial. So linear is basically you ask another grandma, grandma, you know, how did you hurt your knee? And grandma responded, oh, you know, I fell in the kitchen. The circular is adding embellishment, telling stories. And as you know, ancestrally, this is how we passed on our tradition from our ancestors to even now our generation. So we've been used to this type of uh, storytelling. Also in America, right, we highlight the value of being independent. So if you have kids, obviously not all kids are sent to daycare, but we want them to be more independent. We want them to, whether it's a caregiver in the home, that when we leave them, they can do things on their own, verbalize their needs. And so we often teach them, you know, give them the leeway. What would you prefer? Would you prefer a blue dress or a red dress? You know, what would you like to eat? So we ask them a lot of questions, training them to speak in a very linear way. That's the first one, you know. One of the ways you can really observe this if you've been in the Philippines is if you go to our wet market where they sell fish and vegetables and fruits, the ale that the selling, you know, the sales lady, you would see how polychronic we are. She can weigh the fish while someone is actually asking her a question about the fruits and how much it costs. And then she's talking to two other people. There's so many things going on at the same time. You also see this in our potlucks, whether in America or in the Philippines. Our titas, our moms, our dads, they're all talking about so many different topics, but they can successfully close out those topics by the end of the potluck event. Amazing, right? So that is being circular, using stories. You know, when I was doing a lot of home visits with Filipinos, this is how I get a lot of information. If I have an intake, I don't usually follow that. I just let them... Tell me stories and I segue based on how I know I need to ask them. But I'm using, I'm anchoring from their own story and it makes it so much more fluid and easier for them 
to follow uh, and for me to do my job. The next one is the low context versus high context. Let me say this in Filipino first. High context, our culture is known to have mataas, connecting with others, but not simply acquaintance, but there's a depth in the way we connect. So we are high when it comes to that, to that mataas. And in that, we use a lot of indirect. We also use direct communication, but we use also a lot of gestures and nonverbal cues. So we are a high context we have that as part of our communication and contrary low context would be like in american culture where it's very direct you say what you mean mean what you say if i ask you state your need that type of thing and so what you would notice as far as physical proximity they say that for the american culture there's this bubble right for an american to feel comfortable you know, speaking to someone else, there's this distance that's that physical proximity and it's uh, quite a bit of a distance. And then they say that Latinx is so much more closer. And in the study of some Filipino anthropologists, Filipinos even closer. And I actually agree with that. You see that a lot in schools. Kids are huddled together, elbow to elbow. That, that doesn't seem to bother Filipinos. If you go to our our so-called version of BART. BART is in California. I, I don't know if you're living in another state, if you call it something else, the subway in New York, but it's a LRT in, in Manila. You'll see people are quite comfortable being like shoulder to shoulder with each other. That's the same look that we have when we envision people squeezed together in a jeepney. So Closer, much closer physical proximity. And when you think about that, you know a lot more. You can hear more whispers when you are next to someone much closer than when you are further apart, right? You can get a lot of their messages. Obviously, I'm using a metaphor here, but when you have that much of a physical proximity, you really have to be direct, just like the, as in, in the American culture. So I'm going to be back and just with a quick commercial break. Thank you so much. Stick around. Jen Kala. Don't forget that the 5 Pinoy Love Language ebook is available now. This ebook is easy to digest but gives you an understanding of the unique ways Filipinos express love. Deepening your cultural identity and understanding, but ultimately understanding you in your Filipinx relationship. Check out the links in the show notes. Another way that we communicate is through the Filipino core value that we call pakiramdam. Now, the closest word I can think of uh, in English is attunement. So it makes sense that when we are huddled closer, to each other, our physical proximity is so much closer than in American culture that we can hear whispers. I just talked about that. And the difference is now, if it really is true that we are connected, could you sense me? That's usually the difference with especially first generation and the later generations in America, the immigrant is used to being sense, right? Even without them saying it, just by their nonverbal cues. If they use, for instance, the Pinoy language of the bog, which is intentionally dropping things, making loud noises to convey that you are upset, overwhelmed, or angry without using anything verbal. And you're expecting the other person to read those cues by pakiramdam, sensing. So they'll be able to do something. If you've done something a little off, you know, ask the person, apologize. But one difference is this asking to be sense rather than to convey it straight up directly. Hey, I'm upset, which is the difference in the American culture. You know, we teach our kids, even in preschool, if somebody 
mess with them you know it's like we teach them hey don't do that i don't like that so very very direct which is not that we don't teach our children at all in the philippines we're pretty westernized especially in manila but that's not the highlight so it's still more important to sense the other person and when we talk about pakiramdam Like I said, this is the most complicated of all the Filipino core values because there's many components to it. There's timing, there's what we call timpla. So when you are mixing juice, someone will ask, Tama na ba ang timpla? Is it the right mixture? Did you put enough water? Did you put enough powder? So there's so many different components of pakiramdam. And the good news is, It can be taught. It's not easy, but it can be taught. If you're interested in learning it, we do have a master class called Pakiramdam. Everything that I mentioned, the links are all in our show notes, so check it out. So the question also is, why do we do it, right? Why do we expect others to sense us? Why are we in closer proximity with our neighbors? You know, one of The reason is that our ancestral practice of listening to nature, right? Listening to our bodies, belief in gods before Christianity was introduced to us. We even have this trial by, by ordeal. And I don't know if you have heard of that, but during pre-colonial times, if someone is suspected of a crime, let's say someone stole the, the chicken from the neighbor, And there are three suspects. What they would do is they ask nature or the gods to make the decision as who is the guilty one. For instance, they'll have a boiling pot and they'll have all the suspects put their hands in there. And the one who gets burnt the most, that's the suspect. That's the confirmed suspect of the crime. And so it's really leaning on gods and nature to tell us what's the best decision to make. Obviously, we're always deeply influenced by colonization. Also, our modern social political climate affects the way we parent our children. When you think about it, especially in the government today, I'm recording this 2021. We have President Duterte as our president as I'm recording this. We know that there's a lot of reports of people just missing. You know, like if you are protesting, you can be just picked up. Obviously, that's not always the case, but that happens a lot. And even unconsciously, if you're a parent in the Philippines, our parenting is based on the way we want our children to be successful in The society so if they're just speaking up they can be picked up even when parents don't consciously think of this our bodies our nervous system could absorb this information and so if you're threatened if you don't feel safe you behave a certain way and you pass that on to your children and then your child rearing practice would be modified based on the feeling of being insecure, being unsafe. I want to end this episode by reading an open letter to the Filipino mom. I posted this on Instagram and really got a lot of DMs. Thank you so much for your comments. But before that, I just want to recap The differences, you know, uh, linear versus circular, low context versus high context. We are the high context. There's mataas na pakikisalamuha. And then there's also this uh, pakiramdam, you know, the way we communicate is like, you sense me. So let me begin by reading now the letter. So here we go. Here's the letter to our Filipino mom, dear Filipino mom. Your silent treatments irritate me to my bones. Why can't you just say what you want? I used to ask. Now I understand that your mother would have gravely punished you for speaking up. And Lola, punished by hers. You are safe now. You can now speak in a voice that's truly yours. So I too can find mine. Nagmamahal, your anak. I wrote this with my heart 
I hope it speaks to you. This is why we're creating content is truly with this mission to connect Filipino relationships. If you're interested in the masterclass called Pakiramdam, go ahead and check that in our show notes. Such an honor to hang out with you today. This is Rowan. Sa uulitin. Bye now. Thank you.